Hey everybody, we're back at it. Hope you all had a good spring break. Um, I didn't really do too much. Oh, maybe that's what everyone else did, just caught up on work. That's, that's what spring break is these, these days, I guess. Um, let's see. Uh, don't think I have any other big updates other than we're finally finishing chapter 10, uh, the last chapter that uh, is included in the midterm exam. Uh, I guess, do anyone have any general questions before I just start talking about chapter 10? Yeah. Is the midterm uh, multiple choice or is it going to be any written aspects? Um, if memory serves, it's it's all multiple choice. Uh, True or false, which are multiple choice because you're choosing true or false. Um, so it's a bit different. It's a slight different format, just because you got to think about things a little differently. Um, but it's not too tough, actually. Well, during spring break, we had a bunch of meetings about how to deal with all this uh, artificial intelligence that are doing things. So they want us to bring back more uh, fill in the blank and short essay. Honestly, I think the AI could do that too, so okay. Uh, so be prepared for that for future classes, I guess maybe. People will start bringing in more of that. Uh, but like I said, uh, you could just have an AI. You could just have it answer any question just about so. Um, any other general questions? All right. Um, ocean ecosystems. So we're talking about the ocean. Uh, that's specifically about ecosystems. <coughs> Same case. It's just not going to work today. It's really not going to work at all today. Eric King. Keyboard. Um, <coughs> ecosystems, well, we're going to talk about all this stuff. One by one. Um, one thing the so we're going to talk about first, coastal uh, dead zones. Coastal dead zones. Uh, well, these are areas that <clears throat> very often you'll have runoff of fertilizer. Fertilizer, well, it's run, it's going to fertilize in the ocean where it goes. Uh, and so you could have big blooms of uh, microscopic organisms that will all kind of take the oxygen out. Um, and increasingly around the world, because farmers are all in competition with each other, everyone is under increasing pressure to use fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, all these things to be more productive per like unit of land that you have. Uh, so the more pressure is for this kind of thing, the more dead zones there actually are. <clears throat> Little maps from the book. Zoom in a little bit to show the dead zones. Uh, in a nutshell, it's where the, the, well, where the Mississippi runs out. And you can imagine how many farms are washing out into the Mississippi, and that has <coughs> a cumulative effect. <coughs> Coastal dead zones around the world. Uh, again, usually correlated with a lot of expensive inputs for, for agriculture, uh, especially fertilizer. Physical oceans. Uh, simple rule of thumb in general, the less deep uh, it is, the more sunlight can hit different areas, and thus usually the more shallower a place is, the more life it has. And then the deeper it is, the less light, and therefore the less life. Uh, of course, you could have creatures that could survive in places without light, but they don't have a lot to eat. I'll put it that way. Uh, but we'll get to that more specific area. I forgot my... My water. All right. <clears throat> um, ocean facts. You probably know a lot of these ocean facts. Uh, I think if there's any of these that you don't. Um, you might not know that much of the world uh, relies on oceans as their main food source. Being in Minnesota here, the center of a continent, although people, of course, go fishing in the lakes and stuff, we can't eat. Uh, we don't eat that much. Uh, seafood compared to like most populations of the world are near coasts right worldwide um, it shows just productivity in some different areas 
right? Uh, especially along the equator here. Ocean facts. You know, the book likes to give us lots of ocean facts, but I'm not going to go over a bunch of them. I will mention, you know, when we talk about the ocean being salt water, right? Uh, well, it has salts. Salts. When we when we talk about salts, we, we're not just talking about uh, sodium chloride, right, which is the classic like table salt. Uh, but salts are all the things that are dissolved into the ocean. Uh, and actually, that's kind of the, the crazy thing about water is it dissolves everything. Uh, if you had a net that was at a, a nano scale, you could harvest gold out of the ocean. Because there's atoms of gold that are dissolved in the ocean. Everything that exists is dissolved in the ocean. Uh, it's just at the uh, microscopic level, at, at the largest, right? Um, so water bodies, I think you guys know Pacific Ocean is the biggest. Um, I'm not gonna go through a bunch of definitions of all the different oceans. Talk about some kind of big picture things. Uh, ocean shelves, uh, those are, or continental shelves I should say, uh, those are the areas that usually have a bit more life, right? So if you see places that look like they're not too deep, um, so for example, this area here, actually a lot of people had wondered for a long time, how did humans get to these areas in ancient times? Well, uh, actually during the last ice age, uh, these areas were actually above water because there was so much ice on top of the ground. Um, and so for example, there's actually ancient human settlements in this area they call Dogland that is now under the ocean, uh, but was for <coughs> large amounts of, of human history, well, prehistory, I should say, before writing, uh, there were people in these areas. Well, those are the, those are today the shelves. What else should I point out here? What else do we got? Cut that on the shelf, abyssal plain, mid-ocean ridge, sea mount, Deep sea trenches. All right, I'll show you all these. Uh, so, mid-continental ridges, right? Looks like looks like a ridge. Uh, this, in general, has uh, well, you have you have volcanic activity bringing up uh, mass constantly, and so that pushes these apart. So that's why if you've ever looked at these and said, hey, these look like big puzzle pieces that could go together, well, they were. Uh, but you've had the seafloor spreading for a good deal of time. Um, let's see, abyssal plains, that would be places that are kind of like at the, the deepest level. Uh, sea mounts, another thing on there. Those are all these little things that are kind of poking up. Uh, you just think of them as smaller versions of Hawaii. Hawaii is just the seamount that kept on going until it was above the ocean floor. Um, and these are all just a little bunch of little baby versions that didn't go that high up. Um, trenches, that was another one uh, that was on that list. Well, the real deep trenches happen usually when you have tectonic plates that are coming together and one is forced down. Uh, and that little gap there where it's forced down so this is a real classic example here because these plates are coming together. Japan is, is going on top and a, a continental place is being forced down. And so that's where you have your deepest, deepest trenches. This is a map from the book, just kind of showing some of the same type of stuff. Let me think if there's anything of interest. Uh, no, it's the same, same type of thing. Uh, again, as I said before, the deeper in the ocean, the less light that penetrates, and so the less less uh, plants and, and those types of life forms that can survive. Average annual sea surface temperatures. This is also probably what you would uh, predict, right? In general, around the equator, a bit warmer. Uh, the saltiness of the oceans, as you can see, has some ups and downs. They're not directly correlated with something like temperature. Um, I would say in general, areas around the tropics um, have a high evaporation rate. Uh, as you can see, a bit higher in the saltiness. 
the equator in general has a bit more cloud cover, uh, a little bit more constant rain, uh, and then the poles, quite a bit less salty. Ocean layers, uh, I'll just show you an image showing you these different layers. Uh, and these are a, a bunch of the same things that I was just showing you, right? I was just showed you Japan, classic sea trench next to it. Um, maybe this is a way for you to picture how a seamount uh, can eventually become something like Hawaii. Many, many tropical islands came about uh, because of the long process of a, of a seamount that kept on growing. Abyssal Plain, uh, there is uh, what's called ooze, and that's a technical term, ooze. Uh, ooze is, is on the abyssal plain. Ooze is all of the basically dead material that fall from the ocean. They have eventually go somewhere. Um, and there are scavengers and whatnot that can eat the corpses of dead fish and whatnot. So there is some amount of life down there, even in the very deep areas. Uh, it's just not very dense. I would also say, uh, you, know, you probably already know, the deeper you go into the ocean, the colder it gets. Um, this isn't just because of currents, it's just because, well, it's being warmed at the top, right, by the sun. The further down you go, the less sun, colder it gets. Not that there aren't also sea currents and whatnot. Um, so the salts that are in the ocean, they're put there by the rivers of the world, right? All the stuff that washes off of all the continents of the world all eventually goes in the oceans. Um, a map of uh, the saltiness of oceans kind of shows you similar to what I was saying, but more, more specifically, I guess, uh, areas that are a bit more salty, areas that are less. Acidity. Uh, well, the oceans have been getting more acidic through time uh, as we produce carbon dioxide, which we produce all the time, and, and things that give us power. Uh, well, a fair amount of that is absorbed by the oceans, which kind of a lot of people have said, well, that's the reason we don't have to worry about it, is because a lot of it is absorbed by the oceans. Uh, a lot of it isn't absorbed by the oceans, and then what is absorbed by the oceans can change the, the acidity. Uh, and this is a bit worrying because when you look through the fossil records and uh, huge mass extinctions that were in the ocean, often this came about through changing uh, levels of how acidic the ocean was. Uh, so, you know, it makes people a little worried because as you recall from the earlier slide, a large percentage of the population survive off of the food harvested out of the ocean. Um, as you can see, the Geography of that changing amount of saltiness uh, is uneven, as, as we say in the field of geography. Currents, um, well, I would say typically currents usually that are that are on the on the surface tend to be warmer, and then uh, the warmer ones tend to, if they go against a cold current, the cold will go under. Uh, unless you're near their poles where it's just all cold and so it's all just kind of evens out and that all the, the currents, whether they're above or below, tend to be cold. Um, let's see, we've got a map of these circulation systems. Uh, I think I talked about the Coriolis effect a little bit before. Just a reminder, in general, that means that things north of the equator will be turning toward the right, things south of the equator will be turning toward the left. So when we're talking about ocean currents, in general, things are moving to the right. In general, things are moving to the left. Uh, as you can see, there's just physical reasons why that isn't possible in some areas, but that is, in general, the, the tendency. Oh, actually, since we're here, we talked about this desert here being very kind of surprisingly cold desert. This is a good example of why that is the case. And then when we talk about uh, El Nino or La Nina, we usually measure that by the temperature of this current. Uh, as you can see in this example, it's usually a cold current, uh, but it switches to warm currents sometimes. That could affect our weather quite a bit. 
So this winter, uh, a lot of snow, uh, people are blaming El Nino. Well, it's, it, that's ending, and so we're gonna have a number of years of, of different weather, probably warmer winters and less snow, but we'll see. You just never know these days. Well, let's see, Teco Canal shows, uh, shells, uh, Bissell Plains, um, Continental Slopes, I think I showed those. Uh, in general, right. Um, so let's see, you can definitely see a uh, continental shelf, you can see a bit more of a sloping there. Uh, anything else of note? No. <clears throat> Just another graphic showing all these same things in slightly different proportions. <clears throat> Life on the continental margins. Uh, well, there's lots of life on the continental margins, and the continental margins is where most of the life of the ocean is, so that's why the, this chapter focuses a lot. Uh, there's actually another chapter later on the, in the text that we're going to talk about oceans a little bit more. Those will be more about like beaches and things and things that are above water, and this is, this is focusing on things below water or mixed, because um, a lot of these things are mixed, uh, especially mangrove forests. <coughs> Coral reefs are not so mixed tend to be under the water and that's about it. Um, so ocean currents actually do uh, shape our landscapes. So for example, you have, a, you have a current that is going this way and it's persistent current. Um, and every time the waves kind of hit the beach, it kind of smushes the sand further down, further down, further down. And so that's why you have these kind of weird geographic phenomena that will happen above the above the water that are made from what's happening below. Coral reefs. Uh, people ever go snorkeling and stuff? Snorkel and see some reefs anywhere? Not yet? Uh, you're all young, you'll travel. You'll travel later in life. Um, well, I've done a lot of diving. I've done a lot of snorkel, I've done a lot of <coughs> scuba diving, deep deaths and stuff. And I would say through time, um, I have seen personally a lot of areas switch from coral that was pretty lively with lots of fish to uh, what's called coral bleaching, which is the coral just turns white and that usually just means it's dead. Um, well, and none of you guys have been doing that. Maybe I'll bring some, some examples into class uh, and do some show and tell. Um, but in a nutshell, well, that's also the reason why I have some coral that I can bring into class. When it dies, it breaks off, it starts to fall apart. Uh, you'll see this on the coast sometimes, you see a whole bunch of coral that's kind of died off. Um, coral's having a hard problem for a number of different reasons. Uh, that ocean uh, acidity change, but also they could just be blanketed with, uh, you know, when we're talking about salts and, and fertilizers and whatnot washing out from continents, if they cover a coral, uh, the coral can't survive uh, and will die off. Even if it gets cleared off later, uh, it's a real slow, long process for coral reefs to come back. Distribution of warm coral reefs. This is one of the reasons why we talk about Australia a lot too when we're talking about reefs and whatnot. Um, mutualism, uh, why is that an important factor? Well, that means that if any kind of one part of this whole system dies off, then the rest also die off. Uh, mutualism can be a very productive form of existence uh, for plants and animals. Uh, that's why there's so much of it. But again, if one part dies off, then the other parts do as well. I'm going to talk about the process of uh, reefs and how they form through time. Uh, this process was actually a mystery for a long time because it takes so long to see um, and people kind of hypothesize for a long time uh, because in nature, you know, you could go to an island that is just the reef around and that's it. You could go to one that has an island mass in the center and then a bit of a gap and then a reef. Um, or obviously this is more of a Hawaii type of a scenario uh, where you have the full 
volcano is still there and the reef itself is kind of newer. Um, I have some kind of more specific examples to show. Um, so the process is, if you picture a seamount, right, a volcano that's, that's growing and growing and growing, eventually it reaches past the surface and it could grow up to whatever amount. Uh, coral reef will develop in the, the shallow area around it and then it will kind of grow. Through time, once that volcano has stopped kind of building and putting more rock and material up, when that stops, uh, wind and erosion will, will wear it down through time. Uh, and so it'll kind of shrink, but the coral reef itself will just kind of become more stable because it's just building on itself at that point. Um, through time, through more, more rain and erosion and whatnot, that entire volcano, uh, that entire structure that was in the surface can be uh, washed away, just dissolved away through time. But the reef, because it's a living, alive organism, uh, it keeps on building itself, so it doesn't really need the help anymore of a volcano or anything else. Um, it does need the help of us not polluting and whatnot, but, um, but that's the general process. And like I said, people, there's, thousands of islands that are like this, uh, especially in the Pacific. Um, and people would kind of uh, explore these and try to figure out how they came about. Uh, but that whole process, for a long time, people just did not think that the earth was that old. And so they didn't think that this process, there'd be enough time for it to, to happen. Because, uh, you know, it takes a long time to, to build and then wash away a volcano. Um, this is one of the reasons why you see news stories all the time about the coral reef uh, dying off, not doing very well uh, in different places. Uh, well, I've already talked about the different polluting factors, um, right? coral bleaching, I talked about that a little bit. And when the term coral bleaching, uh, you know, it, it, it looks like it's been bleached when this process happens. Uh, Causes of coral bleaching. Uh, let's see, Annie's I didn't talk about already. Acidity. Uh, oh, I guess I didn't talk about diseases. That's that's um, that's a somewhat minor way that these are dying off compared to these other ones. Uh, let's see. I'm not gonna go through every detail on that. Um, value of coral reefs other than just being you know life forms that we don't necessarily need to get rid of um, they're they're the the kind of cornerstone of, of lots of different ecosystems right because they they provide um, the immediate sustenance for lots of little tiny fish which which sustain larger fish which sustain larger animals including humans right uh, so we because it's the beginning of many food chains especially uh, well, as I said before, most of the rest of the planet eat more seafood than we do, uh, and so they survive off this worldwide. Um, Great Barrier Reef, uh, as I said, there's, well, it's in the news a lot. Usually the news will say something like, oh, it's mostly dead, uh, and then there'll be other news articles saying, no, it isn't, and then there'll be new ones maybe a year later that says, well, now it is, and then other people say, well, no, it isn't quite. And it's like, well, it's such a large thing, it's difficult to say that the whole thing is dead. More likely that there are large parts that, that die off, uh, but there are large parts that are still managing to survive. Um, Australia itself, well, they get a lot of money uh, from tourists, uh, and tourists around the world uh, tend to go to visit coral reefs because, again, that tends to be where all the life is. That's the stuff you want to see. And coral reefs, when they're living, they're all kinds of different colors. Uh, it's kind of like when I've done uh, dives, it's kind of like going to an alien planet a bit because you're, you know, you're down there and, and you're just kind of floating along and, and of course, uh, like I said, the coral is all kinds of different shapes too. Uh, people might picture one kind of shape, but there's all kinds of different shapes and whatnot. Um, I would say, honestly, 
a lot of tourism damages coral reefs. The book doesn't talk about that very much. The book talks about ecotourism, which I think I've talked about before. The hope that you could be a tourist without destroying the places that you're going to, right? Ecotourism. Uh, plenty of times I've gone on tours where, uh, you know, people will kick up a lot of sand with their fins and those will cover coral, or people will just kind of like smash onto the coral, they'll, they'll drive their boats along it. Uh, I would say through time, people have gotten a little bit more conscious of the damage they're causing, uh, but there's still a lot of places around the world where they just kind of like, they just don't care that much. Um, they'll make money off tourism coming to the coral, but they don't think about, well, it's long-term sustainability of their own businesses if they take care of the coral. Great Barrier Reef, as we were discussing. <clears throat> um, again, we're gonna just talk about lots of different ecosystems, uh, mangrove forest. Uh, <clears throat> well, these are, these are valuable e e ecosystems for a lot of different reasons. Uh, they, they, they often, uh, if, if there's like say a tropical storm and a large wave that's gonna come in, if you have a mangrove forest on the coast, because it's in the ocean and above land, and it's kind of this thick tangling of, of vegetation, when that wave comes in, it often will kind of break it up and slow it down, uh, make it so that it'll have less damage, um, as well as all these other things. Mangrove forests, all right, these are basically trees uh, that have adapted to high amounts of salt, high amounts of salt, right? And so they create uh, shade and, and food sources for lots of different uh, animals. Uh, mangroves forest worldwide. Uh, I would say the classic example of an animal that eats uh, in a mangrove forest is, uh, is manatee, manatees, uh, which, are, which are cool, cool water creatures. Uh, sometimes they're called water cows because that's what they're kind of like. They're just kind of like these great big things. They just kind of graze on the mangrove, uh, on the roots and on the leaves. <coughs> um, the rest of the mangrove forests, I would say, well, as it says there, often these are specifically removed uh, because people want that area to kind of put in a fenced area to do some kind of intense uh, ocean farming, right? Shrimp sometimes, sometimes fish, kind of depends on different things and the geography of where the place is at. Uh, but, but they will just get rid of the mangrove forest because it's kind of in the way, right? Uh, because you need an area of land that is in the ocean that is very shallow uh, and a lot of those are beaches and they're popular as beaches. And so if you want to do this type of fishing, you have to just kind of remove, remove an ecosystem. <clears throat> uh, seagrass meadows, uh, similar phenomena, but tends to be just a smaller scale. Uh, just like when we talk about um, different ecosystems above land. You could have some that are more, have more biomass like trees, and then you have some that have less biomass like grasslands. Uh, a similar thing happens, and similar to what you could picture, there's lots of animals that survive on these meadows. Um, similar things are, are threats to it, but also, what's, what's different in this area is the type of fishing. Um, you know, the, this type of fishing isn't gonna harm a mangrove forest, but, uh, you know, especially like bottom trawling, when they, they take the big fish nets uh, behind a, a ship and just kind of like drag it on the bottom and they pull it up to see what's in it. Uh, this type of fishing, in general, you grab a lot of stuff that you don't want to eat, but they're often living organisms that you have pulled out of the ocean and they have died in the amount of time you've picked out the fish you want. And so they just kind of dump them all back, but it'll all be dead. It'll be like all different fish and things that those they didn't want to get. 
sometimes they'll be going for just one thing. Like they'll have this huge net and they'll grab a bunch of stuff. And sometimes they just want uh, the one right claw of a certain type of crab and that's it. And everything else they've caught just dies and then they just dump it on the side. Uh, that kind of thing I've seen. Uh, seems very wasteful. Uh, let's see, estuaries. Um, Estuaries, in a nutshell, these are places that have um, a lot of kind of nutrients in the water because, well, they're at the mouth of a river, um, and so that water's been coming out. When that water comes out of the ocean, when it hits the salt water, uh, it kind of hits it and stops, and so you could have this area that it's all kind of murky, has a lot of these nutrients, uh, and then an area right next to it that is still mostly salt water. Chesapeake Bay, kind of a classic estuary. Um, this is the Monterey Canyon off the coast of California. This is a similar thing where this is the mouth of a river. Um, and you know, you might not think about it, but uh, you know, where, where waters run out into the ocean, like they still keep their momentum and so they'll keep on carving out an area. And so you'll have an area that's under the ocean uh, and I've actually, I've gone scuba diving these types of areas. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's kind of like, you feel like you're flying over the Grand Canyon a bit. Uh, you could get a lot of vertigo and if you're afraid of heights, it could be a little, a little freaky. Uh, but you know, you have these great big things that are like the Grand Canyon, but they're under the ocean. Estuaries, similar stuff as other places. <clears throat> Kelp forests, kelp again, another, uh, help a lot of different organisms. Uh, I would say, well, yeah, the otter. Um, the otter has been a, a big factor in this area uh, because they're a keystone species. Uh, geography of where kelp forests are. Keystone, uh, keystone species, I think we've talked about this in a couple other chapters, uh, but a reminder, usually it's a predator that humans have taken out of different ecosystems because humans want to eat the things a predator eats, right? And historically, humans have just considered competing predators as pests, right? So I want to get rid of these competing predators because we want to eat that stuff and they're eating it. Um, but what, what we didn't realize this whole time of, of human existence when we were killing off these different predators, that they actually have a, a vital part of those ecosystems. They do a lot uh, in those places. Um, well, in this specific example, uh, maybe, I'll just, maybe I'll just read it, or should I just give a summary? Um, Yeah, if I try to summarize, um, right, purple sea urchins feed on kelp hold fast, killing the whole kelp plant. When the sea otter was removed, sea urchin populations grew. As a result, kelp forests and species that depend on them <coughs> suffered, right? So in a nutshell, um, you know, the kelp forests uh, are an ecosystem that sustain lots of different plants and animals. Um, Things that eat that forest, well, if you don't have things that eat the things that eat that forest, then those things eat the whole forest, right? And so these keep those limited. Uh, so when we took that predator out of that ecosystem, similar to other ecosystems like overgrazing on land, if we take away the wolves and whatnot, you could have overgrazing in areas uh, and that could cause mudslides and all kinds of things. Towards the kelp forests. Uh, oh. Have a great day. The door. Why are people so loud? Um, beaches and rocky shores. Again, these are areas of note uh, because so much sun can can hit the bottom, uh, the land in these areas, and so there's lots of biomass, uh, tide pools, areas like that. Um, when it comes to tides, y'all probably know about the tides and stuff, but just a couple, couple of little quick diagrams, uh, right? The moon pulls on the earth, uh, 
and the oceans, the side where the moon is, it will pull, right? So you'll have a, a high tide when the moon is pulling, and then you'll have a low tide. Um, and you also have the opposite, the opposite side from where the moon is, you also have a high tide in that area. And the sun also has a pull on the earth. I know that's kind of an obvious thing to say, to say that the sun has a gra gravity pull on the earth, but that also pulls the tides, it pulls the water, right? Uh, and so, because of the geography of, of the way continents are laid out, you could have tides that happen, uh, like you have, you have your, your normal kind of one, once, um, sometimes once a day tides, sometimes uh, multiple times a day tides, and sometimes these tides can have uh, very strong differences. Uh, so if you're out traveling in the future, and you're going to some place on a beach, um, check in and see where the tides are because a path that you walked down that you thought would be perfectly fine, I've actually had this happen to me, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, when you try to go back to like your hotel or something, you'll go back and it'll be all this covered in water and you have to decide if you want to go around or if you want to just try to swim it. Um, tides can be dangerous as well, of course, because if you're, if you're hanging out, some tides, as you can see, this is a lot of water change, right? Some tides can come in very fast and sometimes they can go out very fast. And so if you're out trying to get back to your hotel and then the tides start to go out, people get dragged out. I would say I've been to many trips where I've just hang out on the beach and you see people who were kind of out in the area and they didn't realize the tide was coming in or out and all of a sudden they'll just kind of be far out in the ocean and then everyone has to kind of like figure out what to do. Like, oh, is that person out there stuck? Do they know what they're doing? Do they not know what they're doing? Do we need to go rescue? What's going on? Um, this here is a boar tide. Uh, this is one I don't know if you've ever maybe been um, on a stream, stream that, that goes out to the ocean. Uh, when that tide comes in, that tide can kind of go up uh, a river a bit. Uh, and it will, it will look like this. It will kind of look like a wave that is set in place or maybe moving up or down slightly. Uh, if you ever see that kind of thing, that's what that is. Just another visual of tides and how they work, right? The sun and the moon both pulling on the earth and that pulls the tides up. Threats to beaches. Uh, polar waters. Uh, polar waters, right? Uh, a lot of upwelling. Upwelling is just when, when water is coming up, right? And it's important because often uh, this can have, uh, well, nutrients in it, right? Uh, and so when that water comes up, even areas that are very, very cold and you would think do not have a lot of life, um, it's enough. Uh, life in polar waters, let's see, what would I say? Uh, there's a, there's a, as you can again imagine, there's a strong seasonality to life uh, in polar climates uh, on land and in the ocean, right? And so often you'll have these big productivity blooms uh, in the summer, and often you'll have migratory, uh, not just birds and things above land, but uh, sea creatures, migratory sea creatures. This is part of the reason why they migrate, is because you'll have food in areas, um, and they'll often they'll migrate down more toward the poles when it gets too cold, um, but they can't stay down there. They'll eat up all those resources, so then they go back up or down in the case of the South Pole. Uh, in the open <coughs> waters, well, let's see. Um, well, we have a lot of uh, deep sea animals that, that um, migrate, right? They migrate with different uh, um, ocean currents, uh, but you also have plenty they kind of stay toward the top, but they'll do dives, right, for food and whatnot, and then come back up. Obviously, these tend, tend to be the ones that um, are mammals, right? And so they have to go up to breathe. Uh, so it's, of course, in their nature to stay near the top, and they can't really uh, go under for long periods of time. I mean, they're long periods of time compared to what we could do. Uh, but they have, most of their life itself is, is near the surface. Um, 
vertical migrations, they call it, uh, when you're going up and down. Transocean migrations, uh, you know, again, <clears throat> some examples of, of some of these migrations. As you can see, it could go across a very large distance, uh, sometimes a not so large distance, uh, but uh, predators especially, they gotta kind of keep <coughs> where there's prey, right? And so if the prey migrates or if the prey can be used up in one area and so you have to go to another until that area replenishes, Life in the deep, um, like I said, in the deep areas, you don't have a lot of water, or water, you don't have enough light that filters through. Um, and so a lot of creatures create their own light. So if you ever see, sometimes there are viral videos and stuff of little cool glow-in-the-dark creatures and stuff. Often those will be creatures that are at the very lowest depths. Um, and often they'll create, create their own light, not necessarily to light where they are so that they could see better, but usually it's a, a method for bringing in prey, uh, for luring in something you want to eat. <clears throat> um, there's lots of these fish that, you know, have a little kind of glowing appendage on it uh, that they'll have in front of them to try to entice something that it wants to eat near it. Uh, like I said, sometimes these are and viral clips that oh, get spread around places. Oh, I don't need to show you this. Right. Um, seamounts and hydrothermal vents. Seamounts and hydrothermal vents. Uh, these are of note because often they are in places that don't have a lot of other life, but the actual nutrients from the volcanic activity and the warmth from the vents uh, itself uh, can create an ecosystem. Uh, that can be quite large sometimes. Um, well, this, this one doesn't look too lively, actually. Uh, and this is how we're doing most of our explorations in the ocean these days, is with little, little drones uh, that are sent here and there. Um, the pressures are quite a bit. Similar to when we talk about air pressure, you know? Uh, of course, um, Animals that live in the ocean, they don't feel that pressure themselves, but when people go, uh, this is one reason why, you know, if you're ever diving, uh, you have to you have to do it slowly uh, because your, your body's going under increasing pressure the further down you go. And the further down you go, the longer you need to take to try to make sure that, well, if you, if you rise too quick, uh, the oxygen in your blood uh, will, will uh, well, it'll, it'll come apart from your blood, we'll put it that way. Your, your hemoglobin itself can start exploding. Seamounts, uh, again, a reminder, I always picture a seamount as kind of like a baby Hawaii uh, because they're all, they're all potential uh, islands. And that's also the reason why there are actually so many islands in this area is because there's so much uh, volcanic activity kind of poking up creating little islands all over the place. Hydrothermal vents, uh, I see there's, there's a bit less of them. Uh, you know, again, you might have seen videos and stuff of some of these kind of giant worm creatures that will live uh, near these uh, hydrothermal vents. Um, and they'll just be living off of bacteria. Uh, and then you'll have other life forms that will come in and they will eat all these. and. And so you'll have a whole little ecosystem going. Um, unsustainable fishing. Uh, well, we already talked about how a lot of people are dependent on eat fish. A lot of people are in business getting fish for people to eat. Um, I would say historically, there was never really much thought to sustainability. Never really much thought to sustainability. This is why many of the world's fisheries have collapsed uh, because we just fish them until they're all gone and then we just kind of say, oh, I guess they're, I guess they're not there anymore, right? Uh, so looking for sustainability, I would say in general, sustainable thinking is, is a new thing for humans uh, to think about, well, what if we just catch enough fish and then there's enough fish though that we can come back next year and there will still be fish, you know? It sounds like you wouldn't have to be Einstein to figure that out, uh, but that's just not the way humans have, have really thought about that. Uh, 
industrial fishing. Uh, these are areas that tend to have higher populations. Uh, you can see, actually I'm kind of surprised there isn't more here because, oh, it's because this, this, this population is mostly vegetarian, I forgot. Vegetarian population here, uh, not vegetarian <coughs> populations here. And I would say the only reason we haven't overfished more here uh, is because we've been at it uh, a little less long, I would say, compared to areas of the ancient world. Uh, again, a lot of these types of classic fishing um, just kill a lot of other things. Just kill a lot of other things. There, there are different ways of just like taking a net. Uh, the trawling might be the worst because uh, you're just dragging a giant net uh, and then you just pick up everything that's been caught in it. Uh, and like I said, if it's not what you want, you'll be like, oh, I like this one thing and then the rest are all just dead. Uh, basically most uh, ways of fishing that involve nets do a lot of that. And so um, unless like the best case scenario when you uh, have your specific amount of fish uh, and you could see it and you see that that's really the only type of fish that are going in your net, but that can only be done at the very small scale. You could have individual person with a net, but all these uh, are usually done industrial scale. So it's gigantic and you'll have multiple boats, sometimes a fleet of boats, and they'll just kind of like uh, clear catch a whole area. Well, and better visualizations. Um, like I said, trawling, uh, not only does this kill a bunch of other fish and things, but it really grinds up uh, if there's coral there or whatever. Uh, people often don't check. That's the fisheries. Um, actually, I never, never heard the word for this before, so I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Bycatch? Bycatch? Um, but that is, again, just all that stuff that is in the net that you don't actually want. Uh, and then you just kind of dump it back in the ocean. People will kind of tell themselves, oh, it's fine. It'll just make food for, for other, other things uh, that are in the area. But, you know, in the process, you've, you actually you've caught all the stuff in that area and killed it. Uh, and so it will create food for some. Um, well... I would say also another example of this is when you're catching things uh, and you want just like a part of it, right? On land, the example would be like the rhinoceros, right? People will hunt the rhinoceros uh, just for the horn because the horn has a whole bunch of frankly made up medicinal values that are not true and that don't actually exist, but people are convinced they do. So they'll pay lots of money for this magical horn um, and kill off a species. Sharks, again, uh, predators in different ecosystems, usually humanity have just considered them a nuisance uh, and wanted to get rid of them, because it's like, we want to eat the stuff they're eating, so we want to get rid of them. Uh, a lot of this killing off of sharks just for fin, uh, for soup, a lot of that has been outlawed in, in much of the world, but much of the world, even if it's outlawed, they still do it because there's no enforcement. There's no people like checking and making sure people aren't doing this. Uh, and again, a similar scenario where they're a keystone species, very often predators in their ecosystems. Those ecosystems were stable and sustainable for far longer than humans have existed. Uh, and so it would make sense that they have found a balance that works for that ecosystem that is sustainable. Uh, and so if humans go into that ecosystem and decide that we know better or we don't care, uh, well, interrupt that whole, whole ecosystem and you could kill off a keystone species and you'll think to yourself, well, the shark is eating the fish that I want to eat, so if I kill off the shark, there'll be more fish for me. Then they go back there and it's like, oh, nothing is there anymore because the shark was, was the thing kind of making it all stable. Plastic. Uh, plastic pollution in this region is a, is a very big problem. Uh, well, it's a problem everywhere. Um, let's see if I've got a visual. We've talked about these ocean currents before. Uh, well, these ocean currents kind of pull material uh, toward the center, and so there have been these giant uh, 
plastic garbage islands, they're often called, uh, that ac accumulate. Um, much of the world, if they're on a coast, they dump their pollution in the ocean, right? Whatever that is. Uh, I would say in the US, we often incinerate it because we use it as an energy source, a lot of our garbage, but a fair amount people just throw away, right? Uh, in lots of areas around the world, they, they don't have the, the resources to, to incinerate garbage. Um, and we don't incinerate a lot of it. A lot of it we just put in the ground and then cover up with some dirt and, and pave it over and, and just try to pretend it never happened kind of a thing. Uh, there's these plastics, they do weather and grind down into smaller and smaller particles. Uh, but often those smaller and smaller particles resemble uh, sea creatures that other sea creatures want to eat. Right? Um, and so increasingly they're finding animals that are, that are dead. Uh, and then if you open them up, you'll see that they're full of little bits of plastic. Right, they got filled up with a whole bunch of plastic, uh, couldn't fit in food anymore because your body isn't digesting those bits of plastic. I would say it feels like every year there's a new story about some inventive young scientist who says that they know how to get rid of the, the plastic in the ocean. Just to go back a couple little slides. Um, they'll send out little kind of devices out in these areas uh, things that, that are auto, automated and kind of bring in plastic, uh, and they'll have kind of a net system, uh, but they, they don't do that much. They don't do that much. Like, like I said, I, like every year for the past 10 years, people have come out saying, I've figured out how to get rid of the plastic problem. I think the only real way to get rid of it would be bioplastics, biodegradable bioplastics. This is a new area uh, of science and scientific research uh, but it's rapidly increasing. I would say they've already switched up a lot of like the straws that people use into uh, things that will biodegrade because uh, there's lots of landfills that are just filled with straws, right? Um, I would say bioplastics, I, I would predict that in probably a few short years we'll have a lot more of these types of things. Uh, it's kind of, there's, there's, there's been a lot of breakthroughs lately, let's put it that way, that are not quite at the phase where they'd be on the market. Uh, but like within a couple of years, the, the plastic problem could be a lot less. Could be a lot less. The only downside is because they're biodegradable, things that you have, if it's a bioplastic, it has to be something you don't plan to use for a long time, right? Because it will biodegrade. So you can't use it for like long-term packaging of some type of food because it will kind of, it will rot, right? But straws, like how long are you gonna use a straw for? Things like this, that make them so that they biodegrade in a month, you know? <clears throat> all right, well, that is chapter 10. As you all know, I'd like to have you work on some questions. Uh, let's see here. Page 331, we're going to do the critical thinking questions, number one, number three, and number five. Are those the ones I determined? Yeah. Um, and I didn't bring my cards, so you'll have to self-select yourselves into group. Let's say, you know, three to six people per group, right? Self-select, so. Uh, if you're on an island of people, feel free to move around and, and get into a larger group.